so my name is Eleni Kubuzi. I'll read, so it will go quickly. <laughs> Uh, my name is Eleni Kubuzi. I am a, PH, a PhD candidate um, with the University of the West of Scotland. And uh, I'm also an artist working in heritage engagement projects for the last 20 years. Uh, I have two more authors for this presentation, and they are my supervisors from the University of the West of Scotland, Professor Katarzyna Kosmala and Dr. Gather Rice. Um, Today I am going to talk about findings that I have already presented at uh, the BNO uh, conference of the uh, Critical Heritage Studies uh, back in 2020. So uh, I found this talk quite relevant for today. Um, so this presentation is based on a bigger study called Canal Craft, supported by the National Heritage Lottery Fund and run by the Fort and Clyde Canal Society. And my role was of the community engagement officer uh, in Canal Craft, which became the case study for my PhD. A uh, heads up, it's gonna be a little bit of theory, but I'll try and make it quick. Um, so this presentation will focus on uh, six areas. Firstly, I would like to talk about the context, uh, the, the socio-political and the heritage context of the case study. Then uh, I'll describe the nature of the participant groups we selected. Um, then we'll introduce the theory of the lifescape, uh, building on existing theories. And uh, we have developed the concept of the lifescape as the active environment inside which the heritage process occurs and discuss how the heritage lifescape's materiality has the rigor and liveliness granting it intangibility. Um, then I'll give you an overview of our data collection methodology. Then an overview of the case study will give you a sense of the kind of activities we engaged with in activating the lifescape. And finally, we will share some observations of the complexities of engagement and participants' positionality that emerged during the case study and relate to our theorization of the lifescape. So the lifescape took, uh, sorry, <laughs> the case study took place on the Fourth and Clyde Canal uh, in and around the city of Glasgow. And uh, for people who don't know, uh, the canal was an important industrial waterway that fell into disuse in the 1960s, early 1960s. Uh, it reopened with the uh, Millennium Link project uh, back to, to navigation in 2001 after a concerted campaign by community groups, mainly uh, boating community groups um, all around the canal uh, from Edinburgh to uh, Glasgow. One of the leading groups it was an umbrella boating community group was the Fourth and Clyde Canal Society who partnered in the study. We focused on two localities along the canal, Mary Hill and Kirkintilov. These places were chosen for their significant history of industrial activity and particularly in boat building and boating. Both, uh, sorry, both areas are home to communities that have not been engaged fully in the regeneration discourse or the heritage processes that have developed since the reopening of the canal. The case study involved community groups in a series of boat handling and boating and boat building sessions, celebratory events and participant lens um, activities, sorry, exhibitions. So now a few words about the participants. Uh, Mary Hill is an area with substantial numbers of refugees and asylum seekers due to housing provision arrangements. Participants were recruited from a migrant community organization in the locality and also from a local women's group. Members from the women's group without migration experience had witnessed and changed local environment through regeneration. The Kirkintillo participants derived from community youth groups with most of the participants from the local LGBT plus community and both areas include deprived neighborhoods and all these groups experience different kinds of transiency. So now I'll, think, I'll talk a bit about the theory of the lifescape. So Ingold argues for landscapes as tasks-scapes, implying their processual notion as worked environments through time. He states that to perceive the landscape is to carry an act of remembrance. The memory he refers to is the residue of actions that happened to that landscape in the past. And this notion is clearly relevant to heritage environments to which the concept of activation 
applies. Lorimer takes this argument to a sensed landscape where studies of actions set out to make sense of the ecologies of place created by actions. When Ingold states that processes of, as thinking, perceiving, remembering, and learning have to be studied within the ecological context of people's interrelations with their environments, consequently, their heritage landscape is that entangled environment. The activation of heritage encompasses not only human activity, but also the non-human actants that constitute a holistic heritage environment or, in our terms, a lifescape. The lifescape's action is twofold. It activates the past of the water of the historic environment, in this case, the, the historic waterway, and through the life world of the workshop, where the craft takes place, constantly recreates social space. Adding to the action-generated heritage environment, Laurie Jane Smith questions the obsessions with physicality and redefines all heritages inherently intangible. Rodney Harrison points to the liveliness of the intangibility which informs heritage processes which discards any unconnected elements in the life realm, whilst constantly reworking the landscape via participation according to current needs. In the post-industrial heritage landscape of the Fourth and Clyde Canal, the monumentality, a symbol of industry and wealth, becomes less relevant to local communities, for whom the canal is an integral part of their everyday life and acquires meaning. A volunteer from the women's group in Mary Hill uses the canal top path to go to work every day. It's already a happy space, a happy place. Everybody says hi, the cyclists smile at you, the joggers too, Compared to two minutes down the road, where everybody walks in the street and is busy getting on with their lives. Although the theorization of the landscape as a worked environment in flux positions the activity at the nucleus of the waterscape, we diverge from the potential anthropocentric approach and we turn our attention to Jane Bennett's political perspective of materiality. The vitality of the canal's heritage, the heritage landscape, is manifested through the concept of assemblages. And in the canal waterscape, everything that is sensed and worked creates a polymorphous environment. For example, the debris that has been collected at the bottom of the canal and damages the propellers of motorboats, which then that affects navigation and many times resulting in substantial costly and time consuming repairs. In fact, both Ingold and Bennett advocate for the liveliness of things, their affectual and agential possibilities, and Ingold calls for the dematerialization of the material world. According to Bennett, all of the above contain the thing power, the ability to affect the life world of the waterscape, and by interacting interference, things like boats, um, or weeds are not invisible and silent components of the waterscape, but active agential collaborators in the activated lifescape radiating effectual vigor. The lifescape opens up the problematized situation of agency. According to Bennett, humanity and inhumanity have always performed an intricate dance with each other. Therefore, traditional crafts, such as boat building and boat handling, contain different positionalities and reflexivity dynamics. Creating agency and unlocking marginalized voices resonates with Cosmal and Bill, where through a feminist critique, they explore intangible and embodied heritage practices as unblocking underrepresented and undervalued voices in the environment of the shipyards. The workshop, through the present study, activated the landscape and loosened the agential possibilities of transient communities to find belonging and recreate heritage by selecting pruning. Laura Jane Smith argues that heritage is dissonant as cultural uh, meanings are fluid. And for transient communities who experience displacement, the uninherited heritage, as Grein Koch argues, do not relate to monumentality they inhabit. 
the refugee organization's director said about the boat handling, some women have related the activity to the memories they brought with them from the places they left behind. This unevenness in understanding opens up deliberations on authorized knowledge and another notion of the lifescape, unknowability, which relates to agency. Knowledge in the heritage life world, as Harry argues, is perceived as stable and real, even though it derives from a temporary constellation of connectivity. According to Tiley, experience is incomplete. Our involvement in the world is always situated as taking place from a point of view. Water, craft, tools and boats are the heritage lifescape, fluid and in an ever-changing state. It is unpredictable, affectual and an unsettling entity, therefore uh, similar to Neyman's analysis on water, that it just states knowledge as well as preserving it and this knowledge is multi-specific. The theorization of the life scale challenges notions of hege hegemonic po powers of knowledge. This is in antithesis with the power and the agency of the canal on the canal, the Scottish, can Scottish canals, whose role is safeguarding and protecting the historic canals in Scotland, a fact that frames the power arrangements in the heritage space. The theory is over. So uh, a bit about the methods we used. Um, in the case study, the research methods were informed by the model of reflexivity and positionality discussed by England, where they argue for the personal nature of fieldwork and the important role the background of the researcher plays in this process. The study used ethnographic research to observe phenomena uh, of behaviours and interactions during the fulfilment of the tasks. Uh, I had previously engaged with the community groups in the area uh, of study for more than four years uh, through volunteering and participating in different heritage uh, community projects, which made it easier for me to approach and um, get the involvement of the community groups. A preliminary study, a very interesting one, uh, was conducted in May 2018 with seven local community groups which provided insights into heritage engagements. And these groups were all uh, near and around the canal. Uh, Semi-structured uh, discussions and questionnaires were undertaken with the groups to elicit their understanding of the canal and its heritage and to identify activities that were likely to engage the groups. This, pro this process revealed tension in interactions, both with the waterway and its post-industrial heritage. Um, the case study took place between May 2018 and October 2019. The groups built three skiffs, which are small boats, and a set of oar for each of the boats, under the guidance of a professional boat builder. Boat building and boat handling workshops in Mary Hill took place between March and July 2019, and the celebratory event in June 2019, and it was uh, during the Refugee Festival, uh, Scottish Refugee Festival. The boat building sessions in Kirkintilloch took place in August 2019, with a celebratory event, event and a co-curated exhibition in October until November 2019. The co-curated exhibition happened in the uh, Kirkintilloch heritage space, the new heritage space. The preliminary study informed collective decisions about activities. Based on participant responses, boat building and boat handling activities were devised, uh, along with a celebratory event and exhibition in each locality. Participants from the women's groups in Medihill organizations also took part in boat handling experiences organized by the Fourth and Clyde Canal Society. In May and August, the women's groups in Mary Hill went for a two-hour cruises with the Fourth and Clyde Canal Society's volunteers to learn to steer the boat. So they used a tiller, a boat with a tiller. For most women, that was the first time they went on a canal boat. Some had the opportunity to steer the boat under supervision and to learn about the behavior of the boat in the canal. And this immersed participants in the practicalities of boat handling a risk assessment and understanding the water through the craft and thus generating knowledge. 
Experiencing the boat activated the waterway heritage for the participants and engaged them as actors in the livescape. These material and immaterial elements radiate liveliness and affectual vigor. For me, today, it was a milestone. I went on a boat first time and rode the boat myself in the canal. I never thought I would be that far, one of the participants said. Another one said, you are more careful on the boat. You notice things you don't notice when you are walking. The Kirkintiloch boat was built by a group of young adults, some being members of the local LGBT plus group who live in, uh, in and around the area. The volunteers of the Seagull Trust uh, boathouse, situated in the South Bank Marina in Kirkintiloch, built on the ruins and the boathouse is built on the ruins of a historic repair boat yard, agreed to host the boat building workshops. And uh, for two weeks, the young group shared the space with the volunteers. That was very interesting. Um, the unusual space of the boathouse was ideal for examining the becoming process. Situated on the canal, the participants spent two weeks getting familiar with the water element constantly present in the boathouse. The boathouse is a, a peculiar place. You always have a, a huge pool of water. At the same time, the door uh, doesn't close completely. Um, so you can see the waterway at the same time. It's a quite intimidating environment. Um, so the unorthodox way the boat was painted was very significant. This is not a boat, a charity volunteer exclaimed when he saw the finished work whereas other volunteers were more accepting. Here, tensions in the activated landscape became visible by heritage being communicated and the different pa patterns it takes to become understood, sometimes in antithesis to accredited discourses. So these all were volunteers that had something to do with boats in their uh, professional lives. Now they were volunteers running uh, canal boats. Uh, they had very set ideas of how a boat should look like in order to be a boat. When the boat was finished, the group had the opportunity to launch it in the boathouse. For some of the participants, that was the first time on water. Uh, we tested the boat and it was a success. It didn't sink at all. The boat and the oars took participants out of their comfort zone and took on a group significance. In the space of two weeks, the group of young people became amateur experts in boats and boating having a hands-on experience that agency on the waterway, decision makers, do not have. So lots of people who work for Scottish Canals don't have that knowledge, the hands-on knowledge. We all put our hands on the, on the boat to make a mark. So they made that uh, boat their, their boat. Um, lunch organically developed to be a significant temporal aspect of the study where people felt mostly relaxed and opened up, expressing their feelings freely. The lunch break was an integral and equally important element of the workshop, part of the activated livescape where tools, craft, knowledge and food congregated in a transient entanglement producing new heritages. In Kirkintilloch, eating lunch together became another tool of the workshop, representing the bonding and the transformation from a group to boat builders. So despite the evident regeneration of the canal environment, gaps in engagement, especially with the water element of the canal, were evident throughout the case study. The case study demonstrated that the practice of the everyday informs a changed environment. On one hand, understanding and place identity is uh, affected by renewal, which have affected availability of social space. But on the other hand, this tension const contrasts with benefits from the renewal process, such as the development of the marina and the towpath and the boathouse. By engaging in workshops that activated the livescape, participants found agency in shaping the discourse an environment they occupy and move towards becoming participants in placemaking. Barriers were identified in understanding that block local empowerment and the opportunity to have a voice in the heritage process discourse and workshop activities provided a means to overcome these barriers. Um, sorry. 
to overcome these barriers. Boat building has certain terms. That was the boat builder now talking. Boat building has certain terms that, have, that are hard to explain if there is a language barrier. But this eventually was not a problem as we progressed, as the boat building became the language. The workshops became a point of practice of heritage making and at the same time highlighted the lifescape entanglement of materials and tools, people and craft, finding a way of making sense of everyday needs, such as friendship, having a goal and a purpose, colleague support, lunching together, a commandship. By conceptualizing the heritage waterscape as a lifescape, the practice of the everyday life of communities living with the waterway promotes understanding of the historic waterscape by the people who live in it. Hegemonic approaches of the historic environment block participation whilst presuming an anthropocentric ontological perception of the environment, whereas in the heritage landscape, knowledge is challenged. The case study uh, insights demonstrate that during the boat building and handling workshops, the craft became secondary and the workshop was transformed into a livescape where connections and interactions beca became the heart of the activity, a livelihood. An activated environment provides the platform for transient communities to congregate whilst allows voices to be heard and be part of a heritage discourse and the decision making and heritage process. We call this process the activation of the heritage landscape, which is a tactic for increasing social justice through futures of heritage.